Okay, so, um, hi Dirk. Uh, hi from Edinburgh, Scotland. Um, it's great to be here. So we're we're going to talk today, Patrick Todd at the University of Edinburgh, Dirk Paravum at Cornell. Um, we're going to talk about some recent work having to do with philosophy of religion and the free will problem. Um, there's a lot being written about this topic at the moment, and so it seems quite timely. I mean, you've written some stuff about this topic. I've written a bit about this topic, but uh, there's even a new book or two coming out on this topic. Uh, one is this book right here, Free Will and Theism, edited by uh, Kevin Speak and I'm sorry, Kevin Tippy and Dan Speak. And uh, so I wanted to sort of use that as a springboard to start a discussion about some of these topics. Um, so the first question I had for Dirk, and so uh, is this. So this is a question that's taken up in uh, Kevin and Dan's book, and it's this that. So a lot of libertarians seem to be theists, and um, the other way around, a lot of theists seem to be uh, libertarians, and so there seems to be some relationship uh, between theism and libertarianism, but it, it's a bit hard to say what it is. And um, so my question for you is, why do you think this is? Why do you think that libertarians are disproportionately theists in the philosophical community um, and vice versa. Do you have a theory about what explains this? Well, let me try the second question first, Patrick. Um, so why does theism put pressure on people to be libertarians? Now, historically, theists, at least Christians and also Muslims, have believed in divine punishment after death and that divine punishment is quite severe. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're a theological determinist, if you believe that God determines everything that happens, even our decisions and actions from all eternity, then it's kind of hard to believe that God is fair when God punishes people mm -hmm. for the bad things they do. After all, if God determines the bad things we do and then punishes us, punishes us for the bad things we do, it seems that God isn't just. Okay. At least that's prima facie so. Now, a lot of people in the historical tradition have believed that God, that theological determinism is compatible with divine punishment. They're theological compatibilists for the most part, but right. there's still this pretty strong tradition of people thinking that that position isn't really tenable. So I think that that's one reason why theists mm -hmm. are libertarians, because they believe that given that there is divine punishment, Mm -hmm. Divine punishment wouldn't be fair if theological determinism were true. So another so, reason. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, so you think um, the compatibilist answer there doesn't seem satisfying, even if it might be satisfying in a more low stakes context. So, so it's not plausible um, that we could be uh, deserving of punishment, uh, even if God determined what we did. Yeah, well, let's see. So the very notion of desert, as you know, uh, I think is not compatible with determinism. But I suppose it might be easier to believe that mm -hmm. a small scale deserved punishment is compatible with determinism than it is to think that eternal damnation is compatible with theological determinism in particular, that's, I think, difficult for folks to believe. Although a lot of people have believed it in the history of, mm -hmm. in the history of religion. So there's one idea. Here's, a, here's another reason why I think contemporary theists, a lot of contemporary theists are libertarians. So if you think of the relationship between human beings as, and God as being you know, like an authoritarian relationship, then maybe it's not so difficult to believe that God causally determines everything that happens, even our actions, and to have, you know, the kind of relationship with God that authoritarianism um, would recommend. Mm -hmm. now, but nowadays, people, a lot of people, and maybe this is true since, let's say, the 19th century anyway, think of their relationship with God on analogy with a really good personal relationship, so a really good relationship with another human being. Now, 
Um, I think it's kind of hard to think that one has a personal relationship with God on analogy with a really good relationship with another human being. And theological determinism is true, because then God would be causally determining all of our responses to God, which mm -hmm. is kind of odd to think. Anyway, I think that the analogy between human relationships and a relationship with God would break down if God were causally determining mm -hmm. everything that we do, including our responses to God. So I think it's much more natural to be a uh, to believe in indeterministic free will, mm -hmm. given that conception of a relationship with God. It's funny because on that latter kind of point, um, it's the thought may not even be that this kind of free will. Uh, as conceived by the libertarian, is necessary for responsibility. What it's necessary for under this thought is instead something like a proper relationship with God. So, you, you know, what, regardless of whether um, the libertarian's form of agency is necessary for responsibility, certain theists might just want to say we have that kind of agency in order to make sense of a relationship with God. That's the thought. Maybe. Yeah, that's a thought. So mm -hmm. uh, the idea is that our responses to God would have to be uh, free, at least with respect to God's activity. Now, I suppose that you know, if, if causal determinism were true of us and of God, uh, and God weren't causally determining our responses to right. Him, uh, it'd be a different sort of story. But the thought that, you know, I think it's very natural for theists in the kind of great monotheistic religions to think that if determinism is true, theological determinism is true. And so then God would be determining our responses. So the idea is, yeah, so aside from considerations of moral responsibility, we view human relationships as involving free, kind of non-free responses that aren't causally determined by mm -hmm. what the person does. Right? So on that analogy, our relationship with God would have to involve um, God's not causally determining our responses. Okay, so at this stage we've got, you know, so we, we've got this curious sociological fact that um, libertarians tend to be theists, um, and theists tend to be libertarians. Part of the explanation here is just that, well, if you're a theist, you you want some. You want to be able to. Well, many theists anyway want to be able to justify some strong form of punishment. They can only do that under the assumption of libertarianism. And then the other thought is, well, lots of theists want to think that we have some kind of personal relationship with God. That only makes sense if we have a certain kind of libertarian agency. Okay. Um, anything else? What do you, is or are those the two main? Those are the two main things. The other question you asked. Was why is it why is it that um, almost all libertarians are theists? There's another interesting question. Now, um, I guess if you you know Chalmers and Bourget did that poll about five or six years ago, and uh, they found a pretty strong correlation between libertarianism and theism. Although there are atheists who are libertarians. And I, I'm thinking of like Mark Balliger. He's got that uh, very interesting book defending libertarianism from 2010, but he's not a theist. He defends it on uh, I mean, his idea is that is that libertarianism is consistent with whatever it is that we know from science and but, biology. So yeah, so why is it the case that that um, that um, libertarians tend to be theists? Well, maybe it's this that uh, if you're a theist, you're in some sense not a naturalist anyway, and it's I think it's easier to believe that libertarianism is true if you believe that some sort of naturalism is false. Where naturalism is very roughly something like the scientific worldview. So if you believe that the scientific worldview is false, only partially true, then it's I think easier to be a libertarian than if you believe that the scientific worldview is the whole story. Yeah, I think that that's got that's really got something to do with it. Maybe that's going a bit more to the heart of the matter, in my opinion. But I just wanted to note that, you know, so you say Mark Balliger, for instance, he's uh, a libertarian. He, and it's not so clear to me, actually. I mean, what Mark does is he defends libertarianism in a sense. He defends libertarianism against certain criticisms. But now, if you ask Mark Balliger, do you believe that we have L freedom, what he calls L freedom, 
I think he says, we, we don't know. I mean, it's, it's an open question. It's an open scientific question at this point. So I, you know, I, I classify a lot of these naturalists who have defended libertarianism, not so much as libertarians themselves, but people who have defended libertarianism. And then it's, and, and I agree, then it looks like there are more um, naturalists who uh, either lean towards libertarians or maybe think it's coherent, but it's harder to come up with examples of atheists who um, say, I believe that we have the kind of agency specified by the libertarian, then the numbers start. Right. Yeah, it sounds right to me. Mm -hmm. Sounds right. So what's your answer to these questions? Do you have uh, anything to add? <laughs> well, you know, one thing that, that you didn't mention that, well, I mean, you mentioned it indirectly, uh, I suppose, is just um, the problem of evil. I mean, so Manuel Vargas in his essay in this book, you know, he likes to say that the theists are libertarians uh, because they need libertarianism in order to solve the problem of evil. So it's widely supposed that uh, the best or perhaps the only good uh, answer to the problem of evil is at least going to at some stage employ the free will defense. But the free will defense doesn't make sense uh, under compatibilism. So theists, they recognize, oh goodness, we need an, an, an answer to the problem of evil. And then they, they say, okay, we're going to be libertarians. Um, I think there's something to that. I do think that there's something to that. I think that theism does put pressure on people to be libertarians because of concerns about the problem of evil. But I think the main thing that I want to say is just that that's not the full story. I think that, um, I mean, there are various different things going on. One, one is, I think, connected to your own work about manipulation and manipulation arguments. So one thought is this, and I've got one other thought after this, but one thought is this, is that um, theists, people who have been, who are kind of coming from the theistic uh, background are already attuned to and considering what you might call the manipulation argument. And so it's it, in some sense, you might think um, they're already primed to see the attractions of incompatibilism. And so they're, they're less likely to be compatibilists. Um, and so since they also believe in free will, they're, they're disproportionately inclined to be uh, libertarians. Um, but that's, that's one thought. But the other thought is just exactly what you said a moment ago. It's not, I'm not so sure that what's going on is that theism uh, re requires libertarianism, although it might. I think that part of what's going on is just that theism for many people is an enabler of libertarianism. It's sort of, so to speak, that the theist is kind of you know, looking at the, the state of the debate and they see that naturalists aren't wanting to go the libertarian route because they think the libertarian route is somehow not, you know, not naturalist friendly. But the theists, they, they don't really mind. They just think, well, I'm already a non-naturalist. Um, if, if, being, if, if being a libertarian requires believing in some, um, some powers that naturalists aren't willing to believe in, oh well. Uh, that that's fine by us, and so they they feel warranted, in other words, in believing in the libertarian's form of agency, whereas naturalists don't. And so I think that that's in large part why you see the disparity that you do is just that uh, theists feel justified in being a libertarian in a way in which a naturalist doesn't. So yeah, that sounds right to me. I think the problem of evil is highly influential in uh, motivating people to be, motivating theists to be libertarian. There's a question as to whether it really works. I mean, right. the basic idea is that, look, um, are we going to blame God for the evils of this world, and particularly the evils that are perpetrated by human beings? And then the thought is, well, uh, you know, free will is a great gift. It allows for creativity, you know, free responses, it allows for more responsibility. So God's justified in 
creating human beings with free will. But given, uh, of course, it comes with a risk that people will sometimes choose badly, and but the risk is worth it. So that's the basic idea. But um, you know, there's, I guess the main worry I have about it as a, um, as a, a non-libertarian is, is that, you know, when it comes to acting, maybe it's the case that God gives us free will, which amounts to freedom of decision. Mm-hmm. But right, once that bad decision's been made, then, uh, and it's time for that decision to be expressed right. in action in the world, then it seems that, that God can take control again without violating our freedom. So, for example, uh, if a terrorist makes a decision to, let's say, bomb some village, uh, mm-hmm. then maybe it's the case that you know, neither we nor God can keep the car- terrorist from making that decision, short of you know, killing that person in advance or brainwashing that person. But um, certainly, you know, we can defuse the bomb, <laughs> and God can defuse the bomb as well, right, given that God is omnipotent. So then the question is, yeah, so why doesn't God allow people to make the free decisions, thereby... Mm-hmm gaining that sort of value, but then, you know, stopping people uh, from carrying out those free decisions if they're especially bad. After all, that's our policy, you know, with respect to, let's say, um, Nazis or terrorists, you know, we, I suppose we allow them to make their decisions, but once the, it's time for that decision to see expression in the world, we do our utmost to stop them. And we believe that that's our, uh, that's our moral duty. So then the question is, why doesn't God do the same thing? Yeah, I suppose that, right, uh, theists who invoke the, value, uh, the the free will defense need some sort of response to that. Um, and that's going to be a big, long story, I suppose. Um, just one thought about that before we, we move on, because, of course, uh, the problem of evil is, uh, is intractable uh, as any other, uh, is as intractable as any other philosophical question. But... I do wonder about this. So, you know, you ask, why doesn't God defuse the bomb? And now now one answer that's sort of popular or that I've heard along these lines is, well, look, I mean, you don't want God just to defuse that one bomb. You know, you want God to defuse all the bombs. And, and so, uh, so, look, I mean, if after a while... You know, I I try to plant a bomb, I make a decision to create this bomb, and then I go and I try to use it to blow up something. Oh, but at the last second, it doesn't work. Um, uh, You know, I I get my kitchen knife, I go to stab my my poor colleague um, in this fit of rage. Oh, but the knife, you know, suddenly at the last minute turns soft or something. You know, this this is a kind of world, you might think, in which... Eventually, we just we just would stop trying to um, perform such actions at all, and we would just know that. Well, you know, there's a there's an omnipotent God out there whose business it is to stop us from doing doing bad things. And do, doesn't this now now don't we have to sort of weigh up the the costs of uh, a regime uh, that operates in this way versus the costs of sometimes actually letting people do the bad things that they decide to do. Yeah, no, that's a a difficulty. But at the same time, it's a feature of the great monotheisms that uh, it's appropriate uh, to pray to God and deliver us from evil. (laughs) And um, if you look at the the Old Testament in particular, People, the people of Israel call on God, and God does in fact deliver them from evil. So it would seem to be a central feature of religion that that's one of the key roles God plays. Now, um, I suppose here's you know thought the Ninwagon had. Maybe God does a lot of this. You know, maybe God does deliver us from a lot of great evils. But then, of course, there are some that are left over. Uh, and his thought is that uh, you know, as long as God doesn't deliver us from all the evils, we're all going to uh, worry about the evils that God uh, right. doesn't intervene to stop. So that's an interesting thought about uh, along the lines that you were you were just pursuing. Yeah. Now on your other on your other point on manipulation arguments. Oh right. Yeah. So I thought that's that's pretty interesting. So I think that you know all these st- studies in uh, experimental philosophy show that in general people are um, less likely to think that um, folks are morally responsible if they're causally determined by. Um, uh, by intentional agency. 
as would be the case if theological determinism were true, then they would think that people are morally responsible if they're just naturally causally determined by, you know, natural facts plus the in accordance with the natural laws. So, yes, yeah, so I think that you're right, that if you're um, if you're a theist and you're considering the prospect of theological determinism, you're quite it's going to be more natural for you to kind of resist compatibilism than yeah. you're thinking of determinism as being non-theological and purely natural. I mean, this is maybe jumping ahead slightly, but, you know, one thing I've thought about is this, is imagine, imagine walking up to, say, St. Augustine or Aquinas and saying, and, you know, and saying something like this, uh, you know, I heard you're a compatibilist, but, you, you know, have you considered this, this scenario? You know, imagine there's this very powerful person who wants some event to happen later. And imagine that person creating the conditions now necessary for that event to happen later, which includes someone performing some given action. Are you going to, are you really going to blame that person for performing that action that, that this powerful person set up? Um, clearly, I mean, you know, Augustine and Aquinas aren't going to say, oh my gosh, I've never, I've never considered that. I've never considered that, that strange consequence of my compatibilist view. Um, of course, they're not going to say that because they've been implicitly uh, considering that case the whole time. Uh, they've been building their theories um, under the supposition that uh, there's a God who providentially orders certain things for certain reasons to, towards certain ends. And so, you know, you can't, you really can't uh, try to stump or, or surprise a theist with the manipulation scenario. Whereas, you know, a contemporary secular philosopher who's been brought up in the last 50 years of philosophy, you know, it, in the wake of Strawson and these naturalist sorts of uh, views and theories, you could, you could kind of maybe surprise that person and come up and say, hey, well, you know, you've been defending this theory, but don't you see that that theory is going to predict that someone in, totally within the control of a you know, a godlike figure is going to be responsible, and and maybe that person's going to say, "Oh, I didn't, I didn't realize that. That's a really bad r result for my view." Yeah, that sounds right to me. Now, I, now I grew up as a as a Calvinist, and there are a lot of Calvinist beliefs that, like other theists, find hard to take. But from within the from within the Calvinist camp, I mean, I grew up with those beliefs, and right. there are the you know the beliefs of your team. And right. so you're not going to give them up. So one thing you're used to believing those, you know, having those beliefs. And uh, so it's, uh, um, <clears throat> right. And for one thing, you're not surprised that there's opposition. Of course, there's going to be opposition. So, yeah, so there's, I suppose, the phenomenon of getting used to having certain beliefs. And so, um, and that also applies to the manipulation argument that uh, there are a lot of compa theological compatibilists out there who are used to thinking of God as causally determining all of our actions and used to thinking that that's compatible with, with um, deserved punishment, even deserved eternal damnation. So yeah, yeah. so the manipulation argument isn't going to surprise those people, right? right? Whereas it is going to surprise people who aren't used to thinking that way. That's a good point. That's interesting. This brings me to my next question, which was this, that, you know, if, if there is something in theism um, that is puts pressure on people towards libertarianism or well, anyway incompatibilism maybe libertarianism um, why is it then that when you look at the history of philosophy in fact um, there are so many theistic compatibilists I mean you look at uh, Augustine uh, or at least the late Augustine you look at um, you know arguably Aquinas of course that's contested uh, you certainly look at the Calvin, the, the sort of reformed tradition of Luther and Calvin. You look at someone like Leibniz. You look at Jonathan Edwards. You know, there's this long tradition of theological compatibilism under which, under which God determines all things and human beings are uh, held responsible by God. So, you know, if, if I'm right, in, in some sense, if you're right, that there's something about theism that 
uh, puts pressure towards libertarianism. Why do you see such uh, such a long, robust tradition of theistic compatibilism? Well, aside from the motivations for theological libertarianism that we've canvassed, there's a pretty strong motivation in the great monotheisms for theological determinism. And that motivation is the doctrine of divine providence. So one great comfort that the great monotheisms extend, it extend to human beings is the belief that everything that happens is in accord with the divine plan and God's plan aims at the good of the universe, not only the good of the universe, but at the good of individual human beings in that universe. Okay. So the worry is that if human beings have libertarian freedom, how could there be divine providence? Right. So you're facing terrorism, you're facing wars, uh, you're facing oppression, and uh, how can you have the thought that everything that happens to you, even the really bad things, are in accordance with the divine plan if you believe that you know, the oppressors have libertarian free will in such a way that God doesn't control what they will or what they do. So it's much harder to believe in a strong doctrine of divine providence, which um, affords us great comfort if libertarianism is true, especially if libertarianism is true in such a way as to um, help solve the problem of evil. Because that's going to require not being con God, God's not being in control of what people do. So you think of it as primarily a, a comfort sort of issue so that, you know, look, I mean, we, um, theists want, you know, need or want comfort out of the doctrine of divine providence, which comfort would not be available under libertarianism. Um, that does, I mean, I think there's something to that. Do you, I, I wonder if you think that there's also just something something about the logic of theism where these these maybe this is perhaps the more philosophically sophisticated proponents of this tradition but you know something in the logic of theism that leads these people to a divine deter determinist kind of view where you know the thought is that um all power is god's power right so i mean you know there there couldn't be any source of uh, power distinct from God, but the libertarian po precisely is someone who posits such a uh, a power, in, a power that's somehow independent of God's will. But this is somehow, you know, um, either you know demeaning to God or metaphysically impossible, uh, perhaps both. Um, and so there's something about just the logic of of theism, of thinking that God is the, the source of all power or the source of all being or something like this that leads people to to think that libertarianism is somehow a, a you know, a, a not, not a viable option on a proper theistic metaphysics because it, precisely because it, it posits a power that is distinct from God. Yeah, I think that's right. So if you look at Descartes, for example, Descartes thinks that the doctrine of theological determinism actually follows from God as being omnipotent. And you have similar thoughts in other philosophers, especially in the, in the modern period. Mm -hmm. um, now, I mean, libertarians have resisted that. Alvin Plantinga, for example, resists it. He thinks that, that um, omnipotence is compatible with, um, how do you define omnipotence? You might say that God can do anything that's, I mean, very roughly, that's broadly, logically possible. But if God creates human beings with libertarian free will, then maybe it's impossible for God to keep human beings from um, fully functioning human beings from making the free decisions that they make. Right. So, um, yeah, so I think that, that that idea is present in the, in the uh, theological tradition and in the philosophical tradition, but it's also been resisted by libertarians. And I think it's been resisted by the libertarians in a pretty convincing way. Yeah, I mean, I tend to think about that, that it's not, I mean, I do see that there's something there that, um, you know, there's something, I mean, maybe this is just pointing to what is puzzling about libertarian agency, period, because you wonder, um, 
you wonder how you know how is libertarian agency possible? I mean, it's some you know it does posit some kind of uh, control that's you know that belongs solely to the agent who possesses it, and it's 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 somewhat of a mysterious notion. So um, it wouldn't be too surprising if in the history of theism some people have worried about uh, human agents having that kind of control. Um, so, but I, surely there, there are also, and, and this maybe takes us somewhat away from the philosophical issues, but there's, there's of course long-standing worries about uh, grace and free will that seem to have motivated a lot of these uh, thinkers like Augustine, Aquinas, to, to reject libertarianism. Um, but that, of course, is a, is a debate that doesn't exactly have a, an analog in today's free will debate. Yeah. Well, I mean, there is this question. I mean, the thing is, a lot of uh, theistic libertarians do believe in, in heaven. And uh, at least one very common and traditional view of heaven is that in heaven, people can't sin. Right. Uh, but so if free will is a very important gift that God gives us, does God then remove free will in heaven? Now, this is a view that a lot of people have had. There are some deniers in the history of theology, like the church father Origen did deny it, so he thought it was possible for people to sin in heaven and then be um, be removed from heaven um, uh, due, to, due to sinning. But the broad tradition, at least in Christianity, has been that you know once you're in heaven, it's impossible for you to sin. And um, so if, if that's the view, then it does seem possible for God to make it the case that um, human beings can't sin despite the fact that they have libertarian free will. Mm -hmm. So it does seem on that view that God has a certain power over libertarian free will. That libertarian free will is such that God at least can control which way it goes. So that's kind of a puzzling feature of the of the um, of the most common theistic view about libertarian free will. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to ask Further question, um, which I think... Oh, well. Can I get back to you first, because I think that we have to... There's one question I want to ask you about manipulation arguments before mm -hmm. we get off that topic. Namely, um, you know, if you think about if you think about the free will debate, this is a question about like, how much argumentation there was in the, in the history of the debate. I mean, people state their positions and state their positions fully and firmly, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of, like, interaction. Uh, maybe there's some interactions of interaction about the idea of could it and otherwise. Libertarians say, in the, even in the time of Hobbes, said like Grandma says, well, you know, to be free is to be able to do otherwise, and that's something that compatibilists can't account for. Then Hobbes has a very famous answer. It gives us the so-called conditional account of could it and otherwise. So there's that debate. But you know, if I look at it, there's just a lot of people kind of stating their positions forcefully without really interacting. But in the last while, um, especially in the last you know, 25 years or so, the manipulation argument, one that you've written a whole lot on, has become kind of common currency in the free will debate. So why do you think that that, that argument has become prominent recently and wasn't prominent, say, 60, 70 years ago and before that? Yeah, um, 60, 70 years ago, it's hard to say, although you do see some people maybe 60, 70 years ago um, talking about uh, the ways in which maybe uh, God's control threatens human responsibility. So Anthony Flew, for instance, um, talks about this sort of problem um, in various places, and that was in the 60s. But, you know, um, why is, yeah, so I mean, the question is, why is the manipulation argument taken off? And I think that there are at least two reasons for, for why this is so. One is, you know, the, the, the debates about could have done otherwise and uh, determinism in some sense uh, have reached, I mean, this is, this is perhaps premature, but, you know, they're, they're, they're bogged down perhaps, or that's the impression that people have. Maybe they're, you know, the moves have been kind of uh, developed. Um, so that debate has um, not proven to be decisive one way or the other. And then you have certain sorts of 
arguments coming primarily out of uh, P.F. Strawson's art, uh, Freedom and Resentment for compatibilism. But of course, those arguments have pr proven inconclusive. And so we're just, I think, now, if, it feels like to me, um, in a place where the only progress, that, the only arena in which we can make progress is just something like, what's the intuitive view? You know, what's um, some of these, some of these more technical debates um, about freedom to do otherwise and the laws and so forth haven't, haven't panned out uh, in a decisive way. The Strassonian arguments haven't panned out in a decisive way. So now we're just, you know, thinking, you know, who, who's got the intuitive position? Who's, you know, where does the weight of just sort of untutored intuition lie? And there I think, well, um, you got to consider some thought experiments, and and there, you know, and here we start on the manipulation train. We start thinking, okay, well, you know, one one way we can make progress then on the resolution of this question is just by thinking through some some thought experiments, and and so there's there's that, um, but also I think that one of the main reasons why you're you're only getting the manipulation argument in particular within the last say 30, 40 years is precisely because um, philosophy, analytic philosophy has become much more secularly oriented in the last 30 or 40 years. And you have a much more non-historical approach within the last 30 or 40 years. So, and this is, this kind of goes back to the theme that I mentioned earlier that, you know, in with, you, you can't, in, within a theistic context or within a a debate it within the philosophy of religion, the manipulation argument is, as it were, already on the table. And so you can't, you know, you can't put it on the table. It's already been on the table. It's already implicitly, I mean, its moves have already implicitly been thought through. And so there's no, it, there's no way to put it on the table. But only within the last 30, 40 years has there been, so to speak, a development of a secular literature on the free will problem that hasn't that sort of hasn't had those concerns within focus and so that leaves that opens up the space for a Dirk Paraboom to write determinism al dente and sort of uh, you know bring you know, you know show show some compatibilists that they've got a, a real problem to to answer for and and so I think that that's probably why you're seeing it only recently um, within the history of the debate. That's interesting. That sounds right to me. Um, let me add this, that uh, if you think about uh, philosophy in the last 50 years or so, I think that there has been a trend toward trying to, trying to kind of harness people's intuitions in favor of one position as opposed to the other. So a very common sort of argument that you see uh, in since, say, the 1950s in analytic philosophy in particular uh, involves two sides that are opposed to one another. And then there's this question that arises, how do you break the standoff between these two sides? One way to do it is to come up with a thought experience or an example designed to elicit a certain intuition that right. pushes toward one position or the other. And that's exactly what the manipulation argument is supposed to do. We've got the compatibilist and the incompatibilist, they're in a standoff. And so this is idea that the manipulation argument is supposed to elicit a pro-incompatibilist intuition. And, you know, the, the core idea is that, um, look, the contemporary naturalistic compatibilists believe that um, deserving blame and praise is compatible with being causally determined. And then we ask, well, do you believe that deserving blame and praise is compatible with being if they determined by a neuroscientist or maybe determined by God. And that's harder to believe. And then you argue, look, there's no principal difference between the between the neuroscientist manipulation case or the theological determinist case and the naturalistic case. So that's how the argument goes. And it's designed to break a standoff by eliciting a certain intuition by a, a thought experiment. But I think if you look at philosophy prior to say 1960 or so, that style of argument isn't very common. It's much, it's been, it's much more common in the, um, hmm. it's been much more common since, since about 1960 or so, I'd say. Yeah, yeah, that's gotta be right. Um, I wonder, 
what do you think of the prospects for that stalemate to really uh, be broken by in what what some people might call intuition mongering? Mm. Well, you know, some of my best friends are uh, strongly resist the manipulation argument, despite the fact that I'm a proponent. So, for example, I've written this um, book with Michael McKenna. It came out just a few months ago. It's a kind of a uh, an account, a historical account of the free will debate up until the present time, um, and it's uh, it's called Free Will: A Contemporary Introduction. But he's just he just resists that the the intuition that uh, the manipulated agent is not responsible. Okay, so he's a so-called hardliner, uh, and you know I don't I don't think that there's any prospect of me ever convincing him by means of manipulation argument that compatibilism is false. So, yeah, and, you know, like, I grew up a Calvinist, like I said, and, uh, you know, I mean, even if, even if the kind of difficult doctrines of Calvinism are, in the end, untenable, you know, people get used to believing them. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I don't think, I mean, of course, you know, there's a possibility that compatibilism is true. That's something that uh, I suppose you and I have to countenance. Uh, but on the supposition that it's false, um, it might be difficult to to argue even by means of a manipulation argument um, or to convince a, a, a person who's already a committed compatibilist by means of a manipulation argument that compatibilism is false. I think that's true. At the same time, I do think that probably the manipulation argument is stopping the the tide, perhaps, in favor of compatibilism. Or let's just say this. But for the manipulation argument, lots more people would would be compatibilists, uh, or just maybe, or maybe very confident compatibilists. I mean, maybe it's keeping some people uh, on the fence or uh, a bit less sure, and so or they, they feel bothered by it. Um, whereas, but for but for the manipulation argument, they would just sort of think, what's the problem? Um, so that's probably true. Um, but yeah, it's probably at the same time, it's probably not going to uh, uh, resolve the long-standing dispute, um, and that's uh, that's okay. But um, so now, I want to ask. Uh, well, I was just going to say that's good for the future of philosophy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's good for our continued paychecks. Uh, um, so I wanted to ask this because you you make this interesting sort of argument in this free will and theism book uh, that, um, you know, it, it seems in some sense a radical suggestion. Um, it seemed somewhat radical to me when I read it, which is that, you know, traditional religion may not depend on the idea that any of us are basic dessert responsible. In other words, traditional religion may be able to do without these ideas that people are morally responsible, we have free will. Um, so in other words, you want to open up the space, I suppose, for someone to be um, what you might call a theistic or a religious hard and compatibilist. And, you know, I mean, this view, it's, it strikes me, and I'm sure it would strike many, is very, you know, religiously non-traditional um, and you know, revisionary, uh, to, to try to paint the picture of traditional religion without the idea of human moral responsibility seems difficult. So um, I, I'm just curious about this. I mean, first of all, why do you think that this view um, doesn't have much historical support? And then second, uh, do you think that going forward, this view will gain more support within maybe uh, traditionalist religion, um, maybe in the United States or Europe or elsewhere. I mean, do you see that? The, do you see this kind of religious picture being endorsed by significant um, or somewhat significant proportions of the folk, or do you think it's going to be permanently very minority? Okay, so I think it's very important for traditional religion that human beings are morally responsible. 
And so to deny that human beings are morally responsible because they don't have free will goes counter to the spirit of core ideas in the great monotheism. Now, um, I think it's important to see that more responsibility is kind of a complicated notion. It's because our practice of holding morally responsible has a certain degree of complexity, okay? particularly the different aspects of that practice. So one kind of justification we have for, say, blaming and punishing people is just that they deserve it. Okay? So that's the desert component. Now, another justification, and this is very important in one's treatment of children, like when one reprimands one's children, does one reprimand them because they deserve it? Is that the main reason? Or is something else going on? I'd say most parents would say that uh, the point of reprimanding one's children when they behave badly is uh, moral formation of character. Okay? So the idea is to that parents have a role in forming a child's character, and they do part, this partly through holding the child morally responsible. Okay? Another reason to hold people morally responsible is that sometimes bad things people do can result in broken relationships. And it's important to hold people morally responsible for the reason of reconciliation, the possibility of reconciliation. Okay, so we have three different justifications right there for holding people morally responsible, which shows that the practice is complex. We have dessert, we've got moral formation, we have reconciliation. So the way I see it, and I think that if you kind of examine the historical debate, it's the Desert notion of moral responsibility that's called into question the free will debate. And it's not the moral formation notion or the reconciliation notion. Mm -hmm. right? So it's that here's a thought I had that look, um, it, you know, theological determinism is true. I think that as an incompatibilist, I would say that that undermines the legitimacy of desert based justifications. It doesn't mm -hmm. undermine the legitimacy of holding people morally responsible in the interest of moral formation or the right. interest of reconciliation. And if you look at the kind of the theistic tradition, I mean, desert does play a role, especially in, you know, when, when it comes to eternal damnation. But I think in religious ethics, the idea of moral formation, the idea of reconciliation has a more prominent place. Okay? <laughs> so I, I think that um, you can be a, uh, an, an incompatibilist and a theological determinist, reject the idea of desert-based justifications, and accept instead holding people morally responsible in the interest of moral formation and reconciliation in relationships. Yeah, so I suppose then people, you know, proponents of traditional religion, say Christians, they, they're going to start asking you about, you know, certain doctrines, doctrines of, you know, atonement, for instance. I mean, what, what sense can we make of the idea of God forgiving us for our sins, uh, or something like this, or, or um, you know, when we've just, in a sense, eliminated the idea that we ever commit sins to be, which are in need of uh, forgiveness. So, so maybe, you know, maybe the tension is going to be um, not not so much from. Uh, a general theistic worldview together with um, no responsibility, but something like particular religious doctrines and how they interact with, with this view. Um, but then, you know, all of those doctrines, say, say for instance, the doctrine of the atonement, um, entirely controversial how they're supposed to be uh, spelled out. So maybe there's room even there for a view such as your own in which there's no um, no more moral responsibility in the basic dessert sense. Okay, so um, first the idea of sin, there's, you know, if you're a, um, a free will skeptic, there's, uh, that doesn't rule out that, that people behave immorally. Like people still behave badly, behave immorally. Um, so they're in need of moral formation. So I don't think that, it depends what you mean by sin, but I don't think sin is ruled out by the, by the free will skeptical view or the, the theological determinist view that denies uh, desert-based justifications. And uh, when it comes to forgiveness, one important role of forgiveness in our um, relationships is, is reconciliation. So somebody behaves very badly, and as a result, the relationship is impaired. Right? Uh, now, um, the 
someone on my side can certainly accept that that occurs. Right. And now it's going to be important for, it might be important for that um, relationship to un undergo reconciliation. So here's one way one party might forgive the other. One party might say, you know, now that you've apologized and uh, you've shown um, you've shown regret for your bad behavior, um, I'm not going to hold the bad thing you did against you, and I'm going to consider our relationship as um, mm -hmm. as reconciled. Okay. So I think there's going to be room for forgiveness on the uh, on the kind of view that I that I uh, advocate. Mm -hmm. So maybe it will turn out, I mean, going forward, that more religious people, once they take on board the criticisms, say, from, from science or from philosophy of sort of libertarian notions of human freedom, um, maybe the more philosophically and scientifically uh, conscientious or... Um, sophisticated such religious believers will kind of come over to a no free will position and start taking um, a no free will position seriously, even within the context of uh, traditional religion. It, it, I wonder, possible. yeah, it's possible. It's a possibility. And if you think of some advances in our understanding of, of uh, let's say, um, the genetic influence on character and behavior, I mean, it's pretty dramatic. And um, um, so as neuroscience and um, our understanding of genetic uh, influence on human behavior develops, this sort of view might become more attractive. Now, mm -hmm. uh, one might even be a libertarian, and, uh, but nonetheless recognize that there's very considerable influence of, uh, from neuroscience, neuroscientific factors, and genetic factors on behavior. So that might make a position like this, maybe not the entire position, but a position like this more attractive to people. I see. Yeah, so so give it some time, possibly, and, and we might see, I mean, we've, we've seen, in a way, uh, some religiously non-traditional views, because of philosophy, gain a lot of traction within the popular culture, I'd say, over the past, let's say, 20, 30 years with the movement known as open theism. So, you know, you go back 100 years, I mean, you can't really find any serious community of open theists or, uh, but within the last 30 years, you have, um, starting with say, Anne Pryor, Peter Geach, Richard Swinburne, William Hasker, and some others, you know, they've put forward this view on which the future is open even to God. So not, so God doesn't have exhaustive foreknowledge. So, you know, a thousand years ago, God didn't know that we'd be here today. Um, nor is God somehow outside of time. And, you know, this view is very religiously non-traditional as well. But look, I mean, in fact, uh, that view seems to be gaining more and more currency over time. Lots of more and more philosophers are endorsing it. So maybe right now we're at the, we're at sort of <laughs> phase one of, um, theistic philosophers sort of taking this type of view seriously. And usually what happens is that there's the, the initial flurry of criticisms that say, oh, you know, this is, this is crazy, this can't work. And then it turns out, oh, okay, it's not that, it's not that simple. And then, and then the view gains traction and um, maybe that's what's going to happen here. Yeah, so that's the open theist, uh, the point about open theism is interesting. So it looks as if People nowadays, at least in in our religious culture, are much more open to accepting maybe a weaker notion of divine providence than was considered acceptable, say, three or four hundred years ago. So, in open theism, God doesn't con doesn't have control over everything that happens in the way that God does on, um, let's say, the Augustinian view or the Calvinist view. But uh, you know, it's not as if people that people are living with this view. I mean, the thing is that. You know, people who are very seriously religious are open theists. And um, so, at least for contemporary people, it's a viable view. Mm -hmm. uh, even though it wasn't a viable view maybe three or four hundred years ago. Um, Definitely. Or, um, but, and maybe the same is true with respect to um, the idea of desert and punishment based on 
um, deserve justifications. Right. Maybe three or four hundred years ago, people weren't comfortable relinquishing that, but nowadays people seem more ready to do so. And yeah. so this stands a chance of um, of um, making its way into into kind of ordinary religious consciousness. <laughs> Yeah, it'll be exciting. Well, it'll be interesting to see what happens there. I, 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 I don't have any. Well, I, I think if I have a prediction, um, which given my openness, open future sorts of views, maybe I shouldn't have. But if I were going to have a prediction, I would say, you know, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised. Let's just say this: if in 10, 15 years, you see some more people within traditional religious uh, circles adopt this kind of view. But I mean, it is an attractive view. Um, solves the free will problem, um, and uh, you get out of a lot of a lot of messes. But um, of course, it, it has its own problems. So, uh, so yeah, we'll we'll see. So here's a here's kind of a related question about about um, the kind of thoughts that we've been having with respect to free will and God. Look, a lot of people don't believe in God. They're we can call them naturalists. They have uh, you know, broadly speaking, scientific worldview. Now, um, do these arguments that appeal to God should they have any should they have any traction when it comes to the naturalist or naturalist, or can they just reject them? What do you think? Well, you know, I think here part of what I'm working on right now is is that what we have to do, I think, is make an important distinction between um, ways in which uh, you might say thinking theistically uh, influences one's view on the free will problem. And then another way, and then so that's one thing. And then another thing is the way in which believing in the truth of theism would influence your take on the free will problem. So those two things can come uh, very much apart. So for instance, I mean, you know, if I, if I come up to a naturalist and I say, well, look, I mean, here's my argument for libertarianism. Um, God exists, there's got to be a solution to the problem of evil, that solution requires libertarianism, so libertarianism, that naturalist is unlikely to be moved, right, because uh, the, the argument employs the existence of God as a premise, where it's, it, it, it needs God actually to exist in order to provide the requisite motivation. But um, I take your arguments and uh, to be... Um, and, and the ones I've developed, to not really work like that. So, for instance, um, your manipulation arguments, you know, appeal to some nefarious neuroscientists. Um, clearly, it's, you know, it's no adequate response to Dirk, Dirk's argument, manipulation arguments to say, well, look, I mean, there aren't any of these alleged neuroscientists around. I mean, that's to miss the point. Um, and so I've tried to develop an argument uh, that sort of builds on manipulation arguments that employs the idea of uh, moral standing. So the, the kind of idea is that um, if God determined everything that happened, including some people to perform some bad actions, well, then God couldn't blame those people for performing those actions. And I hope you agree with that. Um, but then I try to say that ultimately, if you agree with that, then incompatibilism is the best explanation for why that is so. Uh, the compatibilists can't really explain why God couldn't hold responsible those who he had determined to be responsible. But don't, com don't compatibilists think that they have um, kind of more general reasons stemming from our moral practice as to why someone, let's say a human being, who were in the in that position analogous to God with respect to um, our behavior, why a person like that wouldn't have moral standing to blame, and can't the compatibilist can't the compatibilist argue against you using those kinds of considerations? Well, um, it's tricky, but ultimately, I don't think so. Um, ultimately, I think that you can't really explain. Uh, I mean, one, once let's just say this: once you look into the notion of moral standing a bit more carefully, you'll see that this is what I claim you'll see that there's only one way to not have moral standing, and that's to not be committed oneself to the moral values that condemn the wrongdoer's actions. But um, from a compatibilist point of view, it, it should be entirely possible uh, 
that though God determines someone to perform a given action, God does so for a particular reason. Um, and in such a way that God is still opposed to actions of that type, uh, but just simply has uh, some kind of reason for allowing it or determining it. And so it turns out, I think, that in fact, um, the compatibilist uh, on closer inspection can't really explain why God would lack the moral standing to blame uh, those creatures God determines to do wrong. Um, and so that's, I mean, okay, so let, let's just say that that's my argument for incompatibilism. I don't think um, the existence of God is at all relevant to, to this argument. Um, I don't think that uh, it makes any sort of difference whether God exists or not. I just, I'm just asking you to sort of consider a thought experiment in which God cent figures centrally in the, the thought experiment. And so I do think, though, that it's, for me, I mean, it's, it, it is these sorts of theistic thought experiments that, uh, for me, pushes me most strongly towards incompatibilism. Um, it's somehow once I start get, thinking from this theistic thought experiment point of view that I start really seeing the, the attractions of incompatibilism. And so what I would like, I mean, if I were going to try to uh, motivate incompatibilism to some naturalists, I, I want to try to invite those naturalists not, not into um, believing in the truth of theism, but instead just, hey, look, consider things from this perspective. And I think that um, uh, they they should do that, and um, and so I don't I don't really see that uh, the the non-existence of God is uh, is a is a worry to uh, to that argumentative strategy. So is your thought that look um, causal determination causal determination of agency has certain implications, and it's much harder to see what those implications are. Uh, from the naturalistic deterministic point of view um, than from the kind of theological deterministic point of view. So the implications of any sort of determinism become much more vivid if you're yes. thinking of, of determinism as having a theological root. That's exactly right. I mean, I think that's one part of it. Um, but it's just that what, I mean, it could be that part of what's going on is that when you start thinking from the theistic perspective, that kind of puts you into an ultimate perspective, an ultimate explanatory perspective. And maybe there's something about that that leads one towards an incompatibilist result. Um, but just, you know, the, it, it just seems like once you start thinking from this perspective, um, I mean, there's a, there's a good article, uh, uh, seems to be unknown to, to most everyone, but by Robin LePedvin um, called uh, freedom and responsibility from the divine perspective. And, you know, the, the kind of thought is, you know, you can run this kind of argument. If, if God determined everything um, uh, someone did, um, how would that agent seem to God? You might think that, that agent would seem to God like something like an automaton or a robot. Maybe that's a bit unfair, but... Um, but on the other hand, if you think, look, if God gave an agent free will, that agent wouldn't seem that way it, to, to God, right? I mean, if, if you, in other words, if I created an agent and gave that agent free will, that agent wouldn't seem like an automaton or something. It, it would see, and but you use those kinds of resources to push for an incompatibilist conclusion, and I think that those types of arguments are to me, much more compelling than um, the standard stock of incompatibilist arguments, such as the consequence argument or direct argument. Right. Yeah, I like um, I, I, I like your argument in a, in a recent paper where you um, where you imagine God creating a, a human being um, and causally determining that human being to behave, but then you imagine that on the compatibilist view, that person is still free. Now. Um, now, God also has foreknowledge, so God knows that the agent's going to perform some sort of bad act at a certain point. 
but it's not as if you point it's not as if god is like nervous or that god actually wonders whether the agent will would perform the action as you would expect if you really believe that the agent was free right so mm -hmm. that that um i yeah. think that uh, uh that that sort of argument makes makes the incompatibilist view especially intuitive yeah i mean you might think um unless I have a crystal ball, you know, if I create an agent and give that agent free will, you know, and I want that agent to perform a particular, a particular action, I ought to be nervous. Um, but compatibilism uh, would predict that um, I wouldn't have to be nervous. <laughs> and so um, there's something of an intention, a, a tension. So, you know, the, I guess overall my thought is that thinking theistically just kind of makes you know all of these sorts of considerations salient in ways in which they wouldn't be if you're just thinking in a purely naturalistic setting. Um, but at the same time, none of those considerations depend on the actual existence of God. And so this is why I think um, you know the, the the issues we're discussing here today are still relevant to the purely secular free will debate. Makes sense to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, we should. Um, so we we are we are officially out of time. Uh, it's been a very good chat, Dirk. Uh, I've learned a lot, and I hope um, I hope the the viewers have as well. And um, thanks so much for for doing this. Thank you as well, Patrick. I learned a lot from from you as well. Okay, Dirk. All right. Until next time. Great. Okay. Bye.